Hi everybody, this is the first video in a short series where I show how to make a simple space shooter game using the Odin programming language and the SDL2 library. What you see in front of you right now is just part 6, part 7 of the series. It's not quite finished yet, but I couldn't wait to start publishing these videos so you could follow along. Now everything you need to follow along and experiment on your own is on the GitHub repo. I'll link to that, of course, in the description below the video. Now, any of the guides that are available, you can find them in the guides directory, the guides folder. These you will want to read from the master branch because I will make updates as time goes and you'll be able to get the latest um, step throughs, walkthroughs in on this branch right here. But to follow along with the code, you'll want to check out any of the applicable tags right here. So all the tags for the different parts, you want to check those out to see the code but the guides you'll want to follow on the master branch. So for part one today, I just want to go over the code that's needed to set up the basic structure for running a game loop. We cover initializing SDL, starting the game loop, and how to close off the game if we want to exit. So it's fairly simple. Uh, open up your terminal and type, once you clone the repo, use git checkout part one, and that'll give you the code for just this part. So first, some things about Odin and how you structure an Odin program. Uh, you'll start with declaring the package name at the top. Now I've called this package main, but you could really name this anything you want. You could name it game, whatever you want. I just call it main out of habit. Then I import the two libraries that we need to run the program. So core fumpt package, fumpt uh, gives me access to a print line function that allows me to print things to the console. And then the vendor package for SDL2 gives us all the bindings we need to use SDL2. Let's start with the beginning of the program and then I might jump back to some of the things over here on the right side. I might jump to some of the uh, constants in the game struct and that. So now, with Odin, instead of using the function keyword, you use the proc keyword, which is short for procedure. Procedure is just a general name for a function or a method, something like that. So you must name it main. This is the procedure that will be called, uh, will be run when the program runs. The beginning code at the top here with the three defer sections, defer keywords, this is us initializing SDL. So we start by initializing SDL with the video subsystem. Init video is just a flag that we pass into the init function, and this initializes the video subsystem, which allows us to uh, do things like um, get events and, of course, show the window, render images, that sort of thing. If there is an error, I'm using the assert keyword here, which is a runtime assertion. If it fails, then the second argument is printed to the console. This should not be confused with the assert that uses the hash in front of it. In Odin, the hash, hash assert is a compile time assertion, but this assert function is a runtime assertion. Now, Odin also gives us a defer keyword. You might be familiar with this from the Go programming language, and defer just ensures that whatever expression that follows is run at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the function. So once the function runs its course, and then whatever is deferred will be called after that. So we defer quit because at the end of our game loop, I'll just hop over to the right side now, at the end of our loop, uh, if we exit the game, for example, there's nothing that happens here, then instead the quit function will be called and that'll kind of close everything off of the game. Now with creating a window, because that's our first step, we want a window to open when the game runs. We can pass in the title, we center it to uh, horizontally and vertically. We give it a size. Now you can take this sizing and you could put it in a constant, for example, if you want kind of all of your stuff at the top of the game. I usually define some constants um, to kind of define all the settings that I want to tweak. Instead of I'm jumping all over the code, I just set them at the top. So we set our window size and we use our window flags over on the right again. The flag we're, show, we're passing into the create window function is window shown. This isn't necessary because of course the window will be shown when we want to create the window. Um, but I just put it there just so you can see what it looks like to pass in a flag. There are a number of other ones like to make your window resizable, etc. 
I recommend you jump over to the documentation that I linked to in the guide, take a look at the different flags that are available and play around and see what you think. That'll help you get a little more familiar with the library. As with uh, initializing the library, we assert that the window isn't nil. If it is nil, then there's an error. So we get the error and we print that to the screen. And like with deferring our quit above, we defer the destroy window right there. So again, that'll run at the end. That won't run at any other time. It's only when we exit our game loop and the game closes. Lastly, we create our renderer. Now the renderer, you see I'm storing it on the game struct. At the top, looking at the right, I define the game struct right here. There's a couple of fields. Renderer is one of them, which is uh, a pointer. That's what the little, what do you call that? The carrot, the hat. Uh, it's a pointer to the SDL renderer uh, struct. And the renderer um, is what we use to render images and that to the screen, of course. Now I initialize the game struct right here just with the colon equals. With Odin, colon means um, initialization and equals is assignment. So you can compress the two. I believe Go does the same thing if memory serves. In here, there's an implicit type. Now the type, it can, be, um, it can be figured out by the compiler because of course we're initializing a game struct. So we just initialize an empty one here. We're not really adding anything to it until we get to this point on the left, game renderer equals STL create renderer. Now the first argument here is just passing in the window that we just created because we want to render to that window of course. And the next argument is the uh, negative one here. If you look at the documentation, it's just selecting the first available renderer, rendering driver. And our render flags, looking to the right again, render flags, as with the window flags, there's a number of flags that are available. Once we create it, again, I want to assert that there's not an error. If there is, I'll print it to the console. Otherwise, I'll defer uh, the, des the destruction of the renderer till the end, once the game closes. So that's the basically all that's needed for now to initialize uh, STL. Later on when we add sound and things, it'll be, uh, we'll add some things here, but that's the basics that we need just to put some graphics on the screen and move things around. Now this next part in the code has to do with enforcing a specific frame rate for our game. And in other videos, I cover why this is important. So I won't get into it too much right here. Just know that it's easier if we enforce a certain frame rate for our game to make sure that everything moves as we want, irrespective of the hardware or the screen that it's running on. Now to do this, we need to time our frames and we need to enforce or force them to run at a specific timing. And for 60 frames per second, that means that our game loop should only take about 16, 17 milliseconds. To do this then, to time this, to grab a timestamp at the beginning of the loop and the end of the loop, and then we make sure that we don't finish too early. So let's go down to the end of our loop and I'll show you what that looks like. This section right here for our spin lock. I've taken the start time at the beginning of our loop and then I take the end time once all of the loop work is finished. So that's after we get all inputs and we update our screen. Then I get the end time right here looking to the right and I subtract the two to see how much time has passed. And if it is less than our target, time, then we keep getting the end time. We keep looping until we reach that time and then we finish our loop and we present our new scene to the computer. Now to get this time, you see the get time function that I call, we use the perf frequency and get performance counter. This is an SDL uh, function that is just a counter. It starts once the program starts, it just keeps counting up and up and up. We divide it by the perf frequency to get an actual timestamp that we can use and um, use that to enforce our frame rate. So you'll see that at the beginning of our loop and the end of our loop. So here at the beginning, we get time. Here at the end, looking at the right, we get the end and we spin until that matches our target, which is about 16, 17 milliseconds per frame. Now, moving into the center part of the loop, okay, it's kind of sandwiched between the two timestamps, but in the center here, we start to handle our input events. And for that, we have event and state variables that we initialize here at the top. We initialize with Odin, just with the colon. 
we don't set it to anything we don't assign any value to it yet we just put that value we put that variable off in memory we assign we um, put it off to the side and then we get ready to add value to it right here the keyboard state will give us a big array of bytes it tells us which keys on the keyboard are pressed and then the pull event uh, whenever a keyboard event happens so somebody hits a key um, for a movement perhaps or to fire a weapon then that is queued and then pull event just pulls out these events from the queue and handles them so the quit event would be you know clicking the little x on the window um, or maybe you have a short key uh, for your operating system to close a window and then a key down event would be pushing a specific key like an escape key so i exit this game with a quit event so clicking the x or hitting my escape key that both of them will break the game loop and when we exit the game loop we skip all that stuff down below here and then all of our deferred statements from above get called so sdl quit etc so that's how you handle events um, depending on the situation you may use a poll event to handle the keyboard the key down or the key up event or you may just look at the keyboard state i usually use the keyboard state uh, but we'll get to that in future parts now at the end of our loop Right here, there's a big empty space for updating and rendering. Uh, this is where we would actually render um, enemies in our player to the screen, move them around and things. We're not going to do that yet. We'll have to wait till the next one. But here we go, render present. So whenever we're putting new images on the screen, we call a function that isn't shown here called render copy. And everything that's copied onto this background scene then gets presented so the old scene or the scene that we're working on replaces the current scene gets flipped with render present and then we have another um, scene in the background for the next loop that we'll start to draw to until we again present it and then after we present it i call set render draw color because this color will be used when we render clear render clear clears the scene that we were just drawing and now presented we don't need um, any of the data on that old scene anymore, or the background scene. So we clear it. So when we begin our loop again, we start to draw images to it and it's all fresh. And that's basically all there is to the game loop structure that we're going to be working with. So in future parts, we'll add new things to this, but this basic structure won't really change much. We'll uh, mostly be doing things here in the update and render. And then any prep work before the loop even begins, that'll be handled as well. But all the rest of the stuff around that, um, with the exception of handling new states, really won't change much. So if you have any questions about that, uh, please put something down in the comments below and I'll do my best to help. Take a look at the guide, play with the code, try uh, reacting to different um, keyboard events. There's another event you can check out, which is the key up event, not just key down. Um, you can just play around with it and get familiar with the, with the functions that are available here on the screen. Now, you should also check out the documentation. Uh, don't get too far into the weeds with SDL just right now, but you can try out a few new things if you'd like. And definitely check out the Odin documentation that I've linked to so you can get more familiar with the syntax and how to use the language. I think you'll agree that it's pretty easy to get familiar with. There's not a whole lot to it. It's not very complex, uh, but it's very powerful. So definitely play around with it and get more comfortable, and I'm sure you'll love it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.